This week, world leaders gathering for the G20 Leaders Summit in Bali called for an end to the war in Ukraine. Made up of 19 of the world's wealthiest and most populous countries, plus the European Union, the annual G20 Leaders Summit is about tackling the most challenging political and economic issues across the globe. Together, G20 members represent 60% of the world's population, more than 80% of global economic output, and 75% of world trade. We ask, has this crucial summit provided the breakthroughs the world needs on Ukraine, the global economy, and much more? Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news and analysis from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Ian Kavat. Joining me in the studio to discuss this are Roy Lee, Zhonghua Institution for Economic Research, Taiwan WTO Center Deputy Director and expert in cross-strait and regional economies, and also Peter Chase, German Marshall Fund in the U.S., senior fellow and expert in U.S.-EU economic policy based in Brussels, and a former U.S. diplomat, including a stint at the American Institute in Taiwan. Also, also Wen Ti Sung, Australian National University's Australian Center on China in the World, sessional lecturer and expert on U.S.-China Taiwan relations. All a very warm welcome to the show. The G20 summit was upended on its final day with the specter of the Ukraine war spilling over into the NATO territory of Poland. However, Warsaw and NATO said a missile blast that killed two men on a farm close to the Ukrainian border was probably a stray fired by Ukraine's air defense system and not a deliberate Russian strike. A full investigation is underway by Poland at the site, with President Vladimir Zelensky urging that Ukraine be included in the inquiry to determine the facts. Earlier, Russia's foreign ministry said accusations against Moscow were, quote, part of a systematic anti-Russian campaign by the West. NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg said that Moscow, and not Kyiv, is to blame for launching a barrage of missiles targeting Ukraine's energy grid on Tuesday, which triggered the country's air defenses. Based on what we so far know, uh, uh, this is most likely uh, Ukrainian air defense uh, uh, systems or missiles. Uh, but again, this is not Ukraine's fault. Uh, Russia bears the responsibility for what happened in, uh, in, in Poland yesterday because this is a direct uh, result of the ongoing uh, war and the wave of uh, attacks uh, uh, from Russia uh, against uh, Ukraine uh, yesterday. Peter Chase. The deaths were a direct result of the ongoing war and the barrage of missiles from Russia against Ukraine. Is NATO's response correct? Does Russia hold responsibility? Yes. Russia started this war. It's unprovoked. It's aggressive. All the barrage of, of missiles raining down on Ukraine, never mind a stray going to Poland, are directly the fault of the Russian government and the Russian military. And NATO's correct, absolutely correct in its assessment. Mm. Wanti Song, this wouldn't have happened without the ongoing war. Indeed. Uh, of course, as to responsibility, we're still pending a more complete, fuller investigation. However, uh, I think there's a difference between responsibility for perhaps a specific uh, strike or specific incident versus the broader context in which this tragedy happened. And if you're talking about the bigger picture, the bigger picture is that the Russian, by starting this war, has caused so much humanitarian tragedies and chaos uh, on the Ukrainian people, as well as the Russian people, that um, things like this are bound to happen at some point. So ultimately, I think Russia needs to uh, be seen as the one that carries the responsibility for this tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Chase, the, uh, carrying the responsibility for this tragedy, knowing that Russia's aggression basically is not limited to Ukraine itself. This is what this incident has made clear. So a crisis has been averted in the case of the war hasn't spilled over into a NATO territory, Article 5 hasn't been invoked. But still, what is the significance of this incident? It's the closest that we have seen of the war escalating onto NATO territory. The Russians understand the consequences of something spilling over onto outside Ukraine. And yet, they already, in the beginning, they brought in Belarus, 
And it's almost inconceivable that some of their that some of these operations aren't going to have consequences outside that territory. It's really difficult, as this incident has just demonstrated, for a military a military campaign of this size not to spill over. It was irresponsible to start it. And the I think that one of the things that we will have to impress on Russia is the danger of spillover. It's time for them to stop. What I found interesting is that this particular incident happened during the G20 meeting that I think we'll be talking about later. And it was, it was, there were a number of leaders who were able to respond immediately and get together, as well as the NATO defense ministers coming together to look very carefully at the consequences of this for the conflict, for NATO's, NATO's relationship with Ukraine. Um, again, I think that this is, something that the Russian authorities, and Mr. Putin in particular, need to bear in mind. There are consequences. So this is the first time there are consequences. This is the first time that citizens of a NATO country um, have died in a NATO country um, in this war, nine months of this war. Um, and Peter is saying that this is um, possibly that this will continue, um, that there's no question of this, um, the, the effects of of Russia's aggressions being limited to to just to just Ukraine. Do you think this incident is galvanizing US allies, Ukraine US allies, and that even more uh, pressure will come against Russia as a result? I think that's pretty likely. Uh, if anything, this, this attack shows the indivisibility of the security of Ukraine and that of NATO countries, e.g. Poland. So in some way, one could see that that will give more renewed momentum in terms of Ukraine's bid to join NATO, for example, uh, be as a full member of observer status, and as well as, I think more broadly speaking, of course, if as NATO seemed to claim that the responsibility for that wartime tragedy, however you want to frame it, lies with Russia, then how, what's the really the fine line between that and saying that it's a Russian attack on a NATO country, for example. So I think there's a lot of uh, fine balance that we are tr trying to grasp at this point. However, we can see that politically speaking is going to give renewed energy to a Western support for Ukraine now that um, the effect has been felt on NATO soil as well. Mm -hmm. Really. <laughs> Can I have a quick uh, just footnote uh, to the discussion? Well, first of all, uh, I, I think we need to uh, make it clear responsibility for the attack, the final responsibility or the bearer of the responsibility is different from uh, uh, the, pro the, the provocation of Article 5 collective defense provision, right? So Russia is not responsible for a direct attack in this particular uh, incident, but Russia is responsible in full of all the, because that is part of the consequences of uh, aggression that Russia started nine months ago, right? So at this moment, we are not hearing uh, NATO uh, seriously considering uh, uh, um, using all these collective defense mechanisms to, as a response to this incident, mm. but they are trying to define the responsibility of, of Russia, which I think we have been already make it clear that uh, Russia is the final bearer of the uh, should be the uh, bearer of the responsibility of all these consequences. There will be more consequences. Mm -hmm. Probably this is not the end of, uh, of incident like this, but Russia is, is, should be taking the full responsibility mm -hmm. for that. So you're distinguishing uh, the fact that this was not, not, was not a deliberate attack by either Russia or Ukraine. So you Therefore, don't, it's yeah. not involved in NATO treaty yes. as such. Mm, the Article 5, the yes. collective defense. Yes. President Zelensky sees the moment, Russia withdrawing from Kherson, you know, their military loss on the battlefield, to present to G20, in his virtual speech, a 10-point plan for peace. Let's take a look at uh, the 10 points that he has presented. Radiation and nuclear security, food security, energy security, release of all prisoners of wars and deportees, restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity. This is very important, respect for the UN Charter. Let's have a look at the remaining total withdrawal of all Russian troops from all of Ukraine, punishment for war crimes, protection for the environment, stopping Russia's ecocide in Ukraine, 
new security architecture and security guarantees for Ukraine and signing of a peace treaty. Now, the US's top general, Mark Milley, um, recently said in the press conference, he seems to be nudging Ukraine to negotiation ahead of winter, saying that Ukraine should take advantage of their uh, victory on the, on the battlefield, as well as this lull maybe in winter. Now, does negotiation with Russia necessarily have to be giving up of territory? Well, as the situation unfolded in the last couple of months, I think uh, Ukraine, uh, comparing with the starting of the war, Ukraine is in an actual better position to negotiate. Um, that is probably why uh, Ukraine demonstrates a kind of reluctance to enter a negotiation process uh, with Russia at this moment, because Ukraine understands that the situation is, is unfolding to the, to the advantage of Ukraine for future negotiation. Mm. So I think rather than refusing to negotiate, I think uh, that it is about the timing and also the condition for Ukraine and Russia to start the negotiation. Uh, this 10-point uh, 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 proposition that's been tabled, outlined by uh, President uh, Zelensky, which he actually called G20 should be reformed into G19 mm -hmm. to, to <laughs> minus Russia. To, to Russia. Right. These 10 propositions, I think uh, the centerpiece here is uh, a complete withdrawal of Russia troops and also uh, withholding Ukraine's uh, territorial in integrity. Mm. Um, well, he didn't mention uh, Crimea, for example. That's what, there will be contentious points. But what I, I think what Ukraine is doing is just uh, creating the condition and, and set out the outlines or the, 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 the uh, basic uh, framework that Ukraine is willing to negotiate. Mm. Well, this is from the Ukraine's perspective. Of course, Russia will be trying to provide its, its own proposition on the conditions that Russia will, is willing and will. Uh, to uh, negotiate. So I think uh, at the end of the process, so negotiation, I have to say, uh, between Ukraine and Russia is actually, um, uh, the likelihood is increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, and both so, sides so are, are now you, creating are, conditions. Are you saying that you, you believe that Ukraine will give up territory? No, I'm, 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 I'm saying Ukraine will be considering negotiating with Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, these 10 points, we don't, we, we're not seeing, there's no waiting. So which one is more important than the other, we don't know. Mm. We don't see the priorities among these 10. Mm. So at some point of time, both Ukraine and Russia needs to prioritize their agenda. What is their number one agenda, which is their red line mm. that cannot be, has to be uh, uh, the center of the negotiation. And what are the conditions they are willing to make compromise? Mm. So at this moment, I don't, well, they are not, uh, entering that, that negotiation phase such that they need to start prioritizing. Not yet, mm -hmm. right? But still, we are seeing a positive sign that both parties are willing to table, outline their propositions for future uh, negotiations. I think from Ukraine, as a democratic country, I don't think Ukraine president has any, in, is in any position to make compromise or concessions on territorial integrity. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the real, Ray lines. Mm. So it's really up to Russia to see how. Now we need to find some stepping stones for mm. Russia to uh, to withdraw or to to make concessions with dignity. Mm. If we want to have a successful negotiation, this right. was something that the French president said, and he was roundly castigated for this. That's right. right. So yeah. we want to, to. There are two objectives. One, you want to have a, a negotiation that is, you know, to punish. Uh, 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 Russia that has been made a bad decision, or you want a negotiation that is practical in, uh, enough that we will stop seeing more human casualties and, and resolve this uh, dispute. So it really depends on how they set the objectives. And then you will see different uh, their movement around their propositions and also the priorities of their agenda. So in terms of um, give and take, how about relaxing, how about economic incentives like the relaxing of certain sanctions on Russia. Could that be, because in terms of the give and take, Russia wants to take something. So could that be considered? I, I guess, well, first of all, uh, economic sanctions are imposed by non-conflicting uh, parties. Mm -hmm. That is, the sanctions are imposed by US, European countries, including Taiwan. So it is really uh, 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 commensurate to the, the situation of negotiation. If 
if a uh, concession on economic sanction will facilitate, especially in achieving Ukraine's objectives in the negotiation, I think US and Euro European countries will be willing to consider. But in other cases, if uh, sanctions, relaxation of sanctions is not uh, facilitating, rather if you undermine Ukraine's negotiation position, I think it will, it will take a while for, for the sanction to remain in place. Mm. Peter Chase, the leaders um, didn't adopt Zelensky's plan. I think he hoped that the G20 leaders would do that. But in their declaration, their joint communique at the end of the summit, they said that most members strongly condemned the war in Ukraine, most members, mm -hmm. and acknowledged that there were other views and different assessments of the situation and sanctions. In your view, did G20 actually reach consensus on the war in Ukraine? Well, they didn't. I mean, they said explicitly in, in uh, their communique that they did not reach, as you just said, mm. a consensus. But I thought it was extremely important that in a document that normally is based on consensus, that in fact they had that paragraph mm. condemning openly and explicitly condemning Russia's uh, aggressive behavior. And I think that the, the point for that is that the people who felt so strongly about it really pushed hard. Mm -hmm. So which um, countries were those? I imagine it was the Europeans and Americans and, and people mm -hmm. who are much more directly, the NATO allies and, right. uh, to some extent. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, it, it's also important to bear in mind that the way that was formulated probably also reflects that we almost had a G20 in Bali because Mr. Putin was not there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lavrov was. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Lavrov does not get to sit in the leader's seat. And I think that that was an important, that, that was important uh, diplomatically. And it showed that Russia has lost any ability, any moral authority it could possibly have ever mustered uh, to engage in this sort of discussion. So I think that that was, I think that was important. I'd, I'd also like to step back a second. Um, in terms of collateral damage, collateral damage is not a missile falling in uh, Poland. One of the things that the G20 talked about and the summit declaration goes on at some length about is the impact of this war, mm. of Russia's aggression on Ukraine, on the entire world economy, and particularly on food and energy security, two of the things that are in Mr. Zelensky's 10-point plan. Um, and I think that, again, this is directly pointing towards Moscow and Moscow's actions. Uh, and I thought that that was, I thought that that too was extremely important. Mm. Munti Song, the, I, I hear that um, there have been reports that Russia and China had pushed hard against using the word war in the communique and that that had been adopted in any case. Um, so do you agree with, with Peter Chase that we are seeing this movement um, against, against Russia and maybe by association China that perhaps there is more willingness to actually move against the war in Ukraine. I think it's natural that Russia will push against it. And I think for China, it's also natural that China will want to be seen as pushing very hard against the inclusion of the word war uh, in that context as well. Uh, but as Peter sort of pointed out, we are seeing greater solidarity among uh, most likely Western-oriented uh, countries and members of G20 in terms of showing this very principle values based uh, position against uh, unprovoked attacks such as one in Ukraine and Russia at the moment. So naturally, you see people like, or countries rather, uh, like China, perhaps might be initially reluctant to be seen as openly not help to protect Russian interest. But in this instance, you see China for a document that usually requires unanimity, mm. you see China somehow have let it go so that you can have a joint statement of some sort happening, uh, even though, of course, as you can see from the statement, there's sort of a slight compromise there that says most members strongly condemn, i.e. some do not, mm. possibly China in this instance. But even with that, uh, even with that exception included though, the very passage of this statement shows that China may be uh, feeling increasing pressure from this united position from other members at G20. And that may be a good sign in terms of building a more collective front uh, globally as well going forward. Thank you. Still to come in the show, we discuss what the Biden-Xi meeting means.
for the US-China relationship and what the return of the Chinese leader to the world stage means. Now, even before the summit got underway, the focus was on the first face-to-face -face meeting between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden since Biden took office. The question is whether the personal relations between the two leaders can prevent competition from spilling over into conflict between the two biggest powers. Disagreements range from the US-China tech war to the repression of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, but the greatest tension is Taiwan. Biden raised objections to China's increasingly aggressive actions toward Taiwan and said the US is opposed to unilateral changes to the status quo by either side. Meanwhile, Xi said Taiwan was the very core of China's core interests and the first red line not to be crossed. I do not think there's any imminent attempt on the part of China to invade Taiwan. And I uh, made it clear that our policy on Taiwan has not changed at all. It's the same exact position we've had. I made it clear that we want to see cross-strait issues peacefully resolved. Peter Chase. In terms of red lines, Biden went into the meeting saying that he wanted both sides to lay out their red lines. Did the U.S. learn anything new from this meeting? What was achieved from the Biden-Xi meeting? Did they learn anything new? No. But doors were opened in a, in a way that I think is extremely important. When you have a relationship that is as important as the first and second largest economies and military powers in the world, if it's all tension all the time, then there's a problem. And I think that Mr. Biden was trying very hard to say, we need to be able to speak and speak frankly and speak candidly, but we need to speak. And that that was his bottom line. And I think that that was achieved. Um, and I noticed one of the major issues was, would be follow-up meetings with Mr. Blinken. Uh, he would be going to China for the first time. I think that those are very important sorts of things. But I think both sides very clearly stated what they have stated before. I personally thought that the statement released by the Chinese government or released on, on Xinhua was interesting in the way it addressed that last issue of the, the Taiwan, where Taiwan was down and it was more a reiteration of this being an important issue for the Chinese people to resolve among themselves. Sorry, can I clarify, Peter, when you're sure. saying that the, uh, the Xinhua statement had Taiwan at the bottom? No, it was fourth or fifth paragraph down in, in terms of laying out what Mr. Xi Jinping said to Mr. Biden. Mm. I thought that in that sense, it treated the Taiwan issue relatively, it stated that it was important for Taiwan, for the United States and, and China to be able to work together. Mm. And that it said Taiwan is an internal problem, is an internal issue for us. But it was not in a very aggressive tone. Like we have had mm. so much aggression, not least during Mrs. Pelosi's visit. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that conciliatory tone. Much more so than it, it might have been. Mm. And, and so what does that signify? Why is that important or how does that change? things going forward. In addition, I think, to Mr. Blinken going and continuing the talks with their Chinese, his, his counterpart and others, I think that there are going to be, there have been sig signals that there will now be a number of, of normal discussions between US government officials and their Chinese counterpart, potentially including in the military area. This is a place where de-escalation is extremely important. I don't want to be, quote, overly optimistic but it's always nice when those signals come as a result of this very first in-person meeting between the presidents of, of China and the United States. Mm. Uh, Roy Lee, so uh, this, there was optimism around the meeting and Beijing signaled optimism. Wang Yi actually told reporters that it represented a new starting point. How should we, uh, to what extent do you think that it can put a floor under the downward movement between the two powers. Um, how, how can it begin to change things? Right, okay. Now, first of all, I think the fundamental directions remain the same. Right, Biden, President Biden has repeatedly uh, underscored the, the fact that uh, the US is entering a phase of strategic competition with China. But strategic com competition doesn't mean confrontation. That's what he was describing the situation. 
But let, let's be clear, uh, competition always comes with com confrontation. It's like a baseball game. Baseball game, the aim of a baseball game is a competing for a higher score of a winning score. But in the process, you see confrontations, right? But confrontation, I think the, what the US is, the message US is conveying is confrontation is not my objective. It happens, but it's not my goal. My goal is winning the game, is to win the competition, right? So uh, line of communication, re resumption of communication what is important. What does winning the, the game mean? Okay. Now, the US has defined uh, this uh, computation as a strategic computation, a computation that is associated with the ensuring the national security of the United States. So when we talk about strategic computation, we're talking about comprehensive and long-term computation. Comprehensive in terms of area of our computation. So it is not a computation just in military sense, it's a computation in economic sense, also in technology, uh, 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 awareness, uh, value, and systems, mm -hmm. so it's a comprehensive competition. And it is long term, so it is just not, not limited only to Biden. It will be several presidency in the US before they achieve that final objective. No. Okay, so I think that, uh, the Biden administration is making this very clear that we're not changing this direction. I'm not making any compromise. I'm not changing course of this direction. There's a competition, but let's communicate so we don't misjudge each other. We don't second guessing what the other side is thinking without uh, changing my basic direction. So yes, it is positive. It, we are seeing uh, positive signals. I think the meeting reduced the, the likelihood of misunderstanding, misinterpretation or wrongful interpretation of the intention of the other party, but it's not changing the, the basic uh, 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 direction of competition, strategic competition between the two great powers. Mm. And how do you read um, what Peter mentioned, which is a more conciliatory tone on Taiwan? Yes. Well, yes, I think, well, I, I fully agree with Peter. It's like human beings. You, you, you cannot live in 24-hour tension. You need to relax something. Mm. So, and it's not healthy, right? It's the same for U.S.-China relationship. I think apparently uh, Xi Jinping is, is trying to, well, uh, what Wang Yi says as a starting point of, of a new phase is, 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 is demonstrated in the way uh, Xi Jinping is engaged not only with Biden, but also his talks with the Australian Prime, Prime Minister and other uh, uh, leaders from South Korea and other places. You see, it's a, it's a kind of softened uh, tone that he, he talks, right? Mm -hmm. It's not this wolf style of, of very uh, harsh rhetorics, but rather it's, it's more calm and you know complementary, mm. uh, talking about cooperation and the complementarity and other issues. But is there a difference between tone and intent? Yeah, of course, mm. of course, of course. So we're talking about long-term rivalry. Mm. We're talking about maybe 20, 30 years of rivalry. Mm. So you don't want to be in a high tension in the next 20 years. Mm. They will be up and down. So I think they are trying to control the situation by coming down, and, and but in general, we, we, the, the path remains the same. That is the, a long-term competition and rivalry between the two great powers. Mm. Wen Ti-sung, the path remains the same between the two. So fundamentally, fundamentally things haven't changed. Um, I wanted to come to the point about uh, what Biden said to journalists after the meeting. He said, I want to be clear and be clear with all leaders, but particularly Xi Jinping, that I mean what I say and I say what I mean. Now, this is important in terms of his four references to the US coming to Taiwan's defense if China attacked. Um, was this meeting, this first face-to-face -face meeting in, in, in uh, more than five years, was this the opportunity to make it very, very clear to the US about his position, his strategic clarity on Taiwan? I believe the answer is yes. And I think um, what Biden has achieved now is to normalize being straightforward, be straight talking with Chinese leadership going forward. Because for, for, for a very long time, it's very natural for Western leaders to perhaps uh, be carrying a more softer tone when they try to communicate with their Chinese counterparts so as to preserve a positive atmosphere, for example, for exchanges and for the possibility of reaching other agreements on other issues. And Taiwan is often a factor that gets 
let out of the equation sometimes. So when you have uh, the leader of the U.S. in this instance uh, making it so clear, uh, not only virtually, not through written statement, but through direct face-to-face -face meeting with China's leader, who is on, at the height of its powers as well, Xi Jinping, having just been re-elected at the 20th Party Congress. So really, I think this sets a new tone. Uh, it will, going forward, normalize not just American exchange and diplomacy with China, but perhaps that of other Western countries as well. And we definitely see that in that footage we saw from, I think, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's exchange with Xi Jinping just the other day, when she uh, made a few complaints about um, how they had closed our session, blah, blah, blah. There are some information that were being leaked to the press. Uh, you see Trudeau standing up and says that while he does want a friendly relation with China, uh, there will be definitely going forward areas on which they will simply have to agree to disagree on. And I think that's part of this process of normalization of this straight talking rhetoric that China may not like to hear, but Western countries increasingly feel a certain comfort level in terms of saying it directly to their Chinese counterparts. And if you look at what the Chinese statement said uh, after the conclusion of the Biden-Xi meeting as well. Uh, I think it's interesting where they said that, um, that they described Xi as telling President Biden that uh, he thinks President Biden is a man of his words and that um, he means what he, what he says about uh, when Biden reiterated five no's, for example, the five no's about how you didn't seek to change uh, China's political system, didn't seek to support any lateral change to cross the status quo, blah, blah, blah. Uh, she referred to those five no in very affirmative tone. So that means even after the last year or two of turbulence in US-China relations, even after Nancy Pelosi and Chinese overreaction to it, still uh, she thinks those things can be water under a bridge. And on the whole, she still holds Biden in a very, in a very positive light. And indeed, going forward, he said as well that Biden, he trusts that Biden is a man of his words. Mm. And the only problem in U.S. general relations recently are mostly an issue of American officials, quote unquote, not sufficiently understanding uh, President Biden's true int positive intentions uh, mm. towards China. Mm. So really, that really normalized a lot of it, and that makes definitely open a lot of room for other uh, Western leaders to follow suit as well. Mm. Peter Chase, um, so this, this personal relationship between, um, or understanding between uh, Biden and Xi, um, how much will the US midterm election results uh, play into the US-China relationship going forward? Um, of course, now we have the House, which is controlled by a small majority, by Republicans. Um, we have the prospect of you know, either possibly a Biden president in 2024, but also possibly Trump or another Democrat or other Republican. Um, how will the, all this be seen by Beijing? How, what does Xi Jinping want in terms of the 2024 president in the US? Ooh, there, there I can't help you. I have no idea what Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Xi thinks would be most advantageous for him uh, in terms of a, he seems to be making a play for Biden, though. His, his vote he, is going he, to. He, he, <laughs> he does. Um, and well, well there, were oppor there were times during Mr. Trump's presidency when Mr. Trump said that he thought that Mr. Xi Jinping was a very great leader and things like that. There were also times when Mr. Trump was less than friendly. So I, I, I have no idea how he, he does that calculation. So I think the more interesting thing is that China knows that it is dealing with a United States where the political leadership changes. And it's, much, it's dynamic. And in China's case, after the, the 20th Party plenum, you kind of feel like that they're almost moving towards ossified, mm -hmm. because it's not just Mr. Xi Jinping getting his third term, but the people who are right around him in the standing committee are all people who have always been with him and supportive of him. So there's not going to be as much internal debate in, on policy matters. And I think that that's so you have two slightly different uh, systems in terms of their internal dynamics. The Chinese might consider that a sign of weakness on the United States part. I think that that would be a mistake. In that analysis would be a mistake. I think that it was interesting as well, I think, in the statement that the Chinese put out talking about the conversation that Mr. Xi and Mr. Biden had. It was also important that, that Mr. Xi said, 
we don't want to challenge you and we don't want mm. to replace you. Mm. That's a very interesting phrasing and I can think of lots of ways that you could interpret that. But I think that it's, uh, I think it was also trying to say that while, as, as Mr. Lee was saying, there is competition, competition is going to get some confrontation, we don't need to be at loggerheads. We can still, I, the United States and Europe compete all the time. And if you hear this particularly where I live in Brussels, there, the European sense of competition against the United States economically is very much there. But you have to be able to control that. You have to be able to... Be a good sportsman, like Professor Lee said. Yes. <laughs> and this is actually, interestingly enough, in, in the Chinese statement as well. It was kind of like, this is not a game in the sense that there is an end point where one person wins and loses. It's a process. We should both be able to grow. We should both be able to develop over time. So that's the one place where it, it doesn't, it's not quite the same as, as playing a game. Um, I have a funny feeling China may have a more definitive sense than that, but that's what the statement said at this time. Mm. So just a quick footnote. Well, of course, um, first of all, I think uh, we need to complement all these leaders' remarks by their written documents, right? So what President Biden mentioned during the meeting is important, but it's more important actually to look at, understand the, uh, in a context in which the U.S. has, um, you know, published a series of documents detailing and outlining its national security strategy, including a, a, a competition with China, mm -hmm. right? So I think that is the context in which President Biden is pursuing or making those remarks and, and statements with uh, when he met with uh, President Xi, right? That's the first thing. Second thing, well, I, my personal view, we, we need to be cautious about what China was putting on the table. And, and it is equally important to understand what is not on the table, right? So there is always uh, the risk of hidden agenda on, on uh, China's uh, statement. So I think, yes, it is a very important first step, but, uh, but there is still a trust that needs to be built up. The U.S. is working in a context which China fully understands what the objective of China, the U.S. strategic objective. But on, on the other hand, I think U.S. will be very cautious to understand what China really wants. Really, because well, President Xi Jinping doesn't say, doesn't mention that I mean what I say. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's a lot of skeptical views on, in the, on the U.S. side on whether China is so ambitious to replace uh, uh, the U.S. Mm. as a war leader, right? So I think well, I understood that was actually the, the the grand plan of the great exactly. rejuvenation of the nation. So, <laughs> so there, there there will be a lot of uh, discussion, but I think caution and you know, and, and but communication remains uh, important, of course. Mm. Okay, so we remain to see whether they can walk the walk, talk the talk. Yes. Still to come in the show, we discuss whether the world is headed for recession and how Taiwan and Asia would fare in a global slowdown. But first, Xi Jinping met with a flurry of U.S. allies on the sidelines of the G20, including with the new Australian Prime Minister, the first meeting of the two countries in six years. The meeting between Anthony Albanese and his Chinese counterpart was hailed as a thaw in the diplomatic hostilities first triggered by Canberra's calls for an inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. Albanese says he raised the issue of Chinese tariffs and bans on Australian goods in place since 2020. Meanwhile, she acknowledged difficulties in the bilateral relationship and said Australia and China must work together to build stronger ties. Uh, Wen Song, let's talk about um, Xi Jinping's uh, flurry of, of meetings with US allies. Um, we talked about Australia, there's also France and Professor Lee mentioned South Korea on the sidelines of the G20. Is this a chance for Xi Jinping to reassert China on the global stage, maybe to dominate the world stage? I think this is Xi's big coming out party in a way after the 20th Party Congress. And uh, part of the narrative that has been pushing is this thing called Dong Shen Xi Jiang, right? The East is rising while the West is relatively speaking declining somehow. And I think for him, he's definitely got the visuals he wanted this time around in that Biden and Xi summit where he was talking, he was smiling confidently as if uh, China is today finally a true equal to the US. 
So I think for him, it's a visual that will play really well for him back home. And having accomplished this purpose though, uh, naturally I think China is recognizing that it's not the best idea to be taking on too many, uh, too many adversaries at the same time as well. So increasingly you see China beginning to try to soften down on a number of countries that are historically considered staunch allies or friends of the US. This will include, like we see, Australia and Canada, uh, the leader of which she has been having bilateral uh, sideline meetings mm -hmm. through the G20. So I think it's all part of a very uh, intentional approach on the part of China mm -hmm. to find ways to create, uh, I don't want to say divide or conquer, but definitely to find ways to realign a China relationship with these uh, Western countries, uh, which have been difficult for the last couple of years. Mm. Roy Lee, you've spent um, uh, much time in, in Australia as well. Um, the softening that, that Wonti Sung spoke about, do you think that could be as much as the relaxing of some sanctions that have been in place for, for these past few years? That's probably something that we have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Now, China has uh, actually unilaterally relaxed some of the restrictions on uh, Australian wheat in the, in the last couple of months. Uh, most likely for domestic reasons, uh, because of the rising costs and other things. <laughs> And China, is also re China has also relaxed its re uh, restriction on uh, Australian uh, iron ore uh, also in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, again, probably for domestic consumption consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but Australia has constantly calling China to, uh, to uh, end this unfair and, and, and discriminatory and, uh, sanctions that are not consistent with the WTO uh, rules. Actually, actually, Australia has already raised the WTO dispute settlement case against China uh, under the, the mechanism. And another important factor is that, as we know, China is applying for CPTPP membership. And as a condition of accession into the CPTPP, it is important for all new applicants to uh, resolve existing trade disputes with current members before they can move on to the negotiation phase. Mm. Right? So it is critically important for China to uh, receive consensus from Australia, but not only Australia, Japan, Canada, mm. on their, on their uh, application process. Right? Mm. So, so I think what China is doing is a strategic decision. Now they want to relax the uh, relationship with Australia, and also they want to move uh, all these blocks uh, or, or stepping block stones that are preventing China uh, to move on with uh, CPTP uh, session. So my guess is uh, uh, in, a, in a very brief time, we're going to see China removing some, in a very symbolic way, some of the uh, sanctions that they have put mm. on, on Australia's imports. Yeah, so it'll be a win-win for, for both sides and maybe a, a warming of, of ties as a, as a Possibly, result. Possibly, yes. Yeah. Um, Peter Chase, I want to bring in the uh, rather awkward confrontation between Xi Jinping and Canadian leader Justin Trudeau. Um, there was a video that was released online, quite a rare video, and uh, Xi accuses Trudeau, maybe we could see a little bit of that video now. Uh, she accuses Trudeau of leaking details of the meeting to the Canadian press, which reported that he raised concerns about uh, Chinese interference in the 2019 elections. We've, we've got it there up on screen. And uh, she goes on to, uh, seems like a veiled threat to Trudeau, saying, if you are sincere, we should communicate with each other in a respectful manner. Otherwise, it will be hard to say what the result will be. So as a former US diplomat, Peter, did Trudeau break any diplomatic norms? In talking to his press? Yes. No, I don't think, I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's, it's clear from that exchange that, that uh, Xi Jinping was a little bit upset at the way the, the news had been spun by the Canadian press. That, I think, should tell us something, you know, that he responded, um, that he was sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. Canadian press, the Canadian prime minister talking to the Canadian press. And it's interesting to me as well that, you know, the Chinese, as is common in the United States and China, often after Mr. Xi Jinping meets a, a national leader, they publish a statement. Mm -hmm. This is what we said and this is what they said. It's hard for me to understand that what Mr. Trudeau did was somehow beyond the pale. Mm. 
But I thought that that was an interesting exchange in any event because it's important. I actually like when people are talking to each other, you know, and even if they're talking to each other a little bit, a little bit harshly, that's okay too. Is um, because I thought Mr. Trudeau, the way the reporting I saw was that Mr. Trudeau pushed back against uh, Xi Jinping and said, "I have a right to talk to my press," and that I am, and this was something that uh, Professor Sung mentioned as well, that that I have a right to say what I said. That's okay. Yeah, I think that's the way uh, most of the leaders' meetings protocol goes, right? You, you have the freedom. All each leader has the freedom to share with anyone on what he, his remarks is about mm. during an informal closed-door meeting. Yeah, they're not pre-agreed by both sides. They're really separate. Uh, as long as mm. you don't quote what the other leaders are saying. I can fully reflect what I have expressed mm. during a meeting oh. with one leader or many leaders. Mm. That's fine because, and that's I think what that's what Mr. Trudeau has been doing. Yeah. He is not arguing what Xi Jinping's re reaction to his remarks. He's just simply telling the Canadian press that what I have expressed to uh, President Xi mm. during the, the meeting, and that is fully uh, consistent with uh, leaders' meetings protocol. Okay. So I think. I fully agree with Peter. It is so interesting, first of all, to see why Xi Jinping is reacting so strongly to this incident. And so maybe it's, I encourage people to go back to see what Trudeau has been saying <laughs> during the meeting. And also, yeah, it's casual. It's not really casual meeting. Xi Jinping knows there's a cameraman mm. on site and there's a, around other people. But he, he nonetheless raised this concern. So I think it's. It is a very interesting uh, development mm. uh, that probably we will be able to see something out of that. Roy Lee, um, before we end the show, let's talk about the economy. So <laughs> we are headed um, possibly into a recession as, as well as winter, upcoming winter. What steps can leaders take to avert um, or soften the impacts? And can you also talk about how Taiwan and Asia as a whole will fare? Right. Okay. So let, let's let's be more precise. It's only the U.S. and euro euro areas that are entering uh, recession, according to IMF prediction. Uh, U.S. So no global no global recession. No global recession because uh, the U.S. Uh, GDP growth will be in the minus zero point sorry zero point five area. For euro areas, you will be minus zero point six. But for Taiwan, you will be two point four. For China, you will be four. It's not a global recession. It's but primarily the, the US. But the knock-on effects over time. There will be there will be consequences because of the recession in the US and the, in the EU by slowing demand. So uh, export trade is already slowing down uh, last month, and there will be less.